We're talking our, about, in our series about becoming like Christ. And in talking about becoming like Christ, we've talked about certain things. Repentance, humility, obedience, service, walking the second mile. A lot of those things we're actually attracted to. We want to be those things. But today there's a topic that I'm going to speak about that many of us do not want to be like. We actually oftentimes don't want to imitate God in this aspect. And yet this is probably one of our favorite things about God. We look for this all the time obstacles in our lives. It can paralyze people for years. And if you look honestly at yourself, um, there's some people that we're not beginning to we're not willing to forgive, and that in our lives is causing us so much anxiety and anger, frustration, and just misery. So what I'm asking is that we're open to listening to this topic, and this message is for me, as much as it is maybe for some of you as well. The first is on this paper here, this handout, is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We are called to forgive the way God forgives. Not our own standard. Remember the name of this series is the highest standard. And so, nothing that we've spoken about in this series has been super easy. We, we said last week that every step requires two things, no, three things, humility, grace, and the Holy Spirit. This characteristic, I believe, separates, in my mind, good people from real saints. And if you think about what makes our God so special in the biggest way, it's the way He freely, freely forgives. So what is forgiveness and what is God-like forgiveness? Um, those are two important parts. So there's a definition that I found from one uh, monk, and he says, forgiveness is overlooking the sin or transgression of another and restoring a bond of love. It's overlooking the transgression and restoring a bond of love. It doesn't mean that you justify the offensive action. It doesn't mean that you make it or accept it as right. You can acknowledge something is wrong, but you can still forgive it and still pursue the bond of love. In God's forgiveness, and so this is number one, the goal of God's forgiveness is not just to overlook the sin or transgression. God's love goes beyond that. God's goal for forgiveness is reconciliation. Some churches call the sacrament of confession the sacrament of reconciliation. It's not just about forgiveness. The whole point is not that God wipes away our sins and we remain distant from Him. He's not trying to just remove the penalty. That would be like what a prisoner does. He says, can you come and will you forgive my debt and remove the penalty. That's not what we are. We're not prisoners looking for freedom. We're actually children or the bride of Christ looking for restoration. We're looking for reconciliation. So our goal in confession is not to have sins removed, but it's to have a relationship restored. Now, I realize the way we discuss forgiveness, most of us say, okay, I might eventually get to the forgiveness part. But the reconciliation part is a little bit more difficult for me. Well, we have the example of God-like forgiveness, and that's what we're shooting for. Forgiveness is not a one-step decision. It is a process. So, it's great that we begin the process as opposed to saying, I'm not even going to go there. If we're going to examine God-like forgiveness, there's a few stories that we should consider. One of them is the story of Hosea from the Old Testament. It's our favorite story for many of us. It's an incredible story of God's love and forgiveness. 
Hosea, Hosea is a prophet. He is an example of what God wants us to be at that time. He tells Hosea, the prophet, the one who's obedient, the one who's pleasing God, go get a wife. Hosea's like, this is what I've been waiting for. Clearly, I'm a God-pleasing man. There is an angel that God has formed and is ready and being prepared for me. And God said, I have her for you. He says, show me where she is. Does she sing in the choir? Does she pass out, you know, stuff at the synagogue? Like, who is she? So, well, her name is Gomer. First of all, that's like at least one or two counts against her from right there. Her name is Gomer. But what does Gomer mean? It means completion. The filling up of the measure of idolatry or the consummate wickedness. Her name was indicative of adultery and idolatry of the kingdom. They're going to need marriage counseling, basically, based, based on that. So God wants Hosea to marry Gomer. And what is her line of profession? She's a prostitute. He told the prophet, I want you to take a prostitute as your wife. So he does. And he brings her to himself. And they're married. And they're enjoying marriage for a very short time. But her heart is not ready. And so what does she do? She goes back to her old way of life. She commits adultery. She goes back to not just adultery, but prostitution. So what does God tell Hosea? Forgive her and let her go. That would have been a very admirable thing to do. But he didn't say, forgive her and let her go. He said, go get her back. Get her back? No, don't just get her back, but I want you to now go back and purchase her again. I know that she's yours, but we're going to go an extra step to show faithfulness to an adulterous wife that we will do whatever it takes. As difficult as it was to deal with adultery, the infidelity is painful. But then to humble himself, to swallow his pride, and to go back and purchase what was already his. He purchased the unfaithful, adulterous wife. And that was God's example for us. It wasn't just forgiveness. It was reconciliation, and it was restoration. What he wanted to teach us, that there's no sin against him that would exhaust his mercy. No single sin could exhaust His mercy. There are a few things that are extremely difficult to give, not forgive, not impossible, but difficult. I would think adultery is a difficult one. I would say the murder of your family is a difficult one, like a child. God the Father forgave both. He's done that. He's done the difficult stuff, and He showed us how. So what I want you to write here in terms of God's forgiveness. Number two, no single sin, no matter how bad it is, could exhaust God's mercy. You name the list of sins in the world, none of them could exhaust His mercy. And number two, which I think might be more important for us, no number of sins or no recurrent sin, no matter how many times it's repeated, could exhaust God's mercy. The Father described our sins as a handful of sand tossed into the ocean. Handful of sin is plenty of sins. But what is it compared to the mercy of God? It is like nothing. The other story that would teach us about God's forgiveness is, of course, one that we've talked about before, is the prodigal son. You have a father who's very hurt. His young son has withdrawn from him. It's pretty much selfishly rejected him. The father never stopped loving the son. He watched and he waited for the return of his son. The son finally comes to himself. He becomes aware of his own sin, but that's it. He's not aware of how much he hurt the father. He's aware of his own sin and he returns. Thinking of himself and his own needs, not the father's, he rehearses this speech about how to come back to the Father. 
He says, make me like one of your employees. The father doesn't let him even finish his rehearsed speech. He doesn't allow him to become an employee. He embraces the son, he brings him to himself, and he has a robe and a ring, and he restores him as a son and an heir. He kills the calf, the fatted calf, sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. He doesn't demand an apology when the son comes back. He doesn't say that in the story. The son comes and he embraces him. He actually didn't permit any justification for the sin. There's no self-denigration on the part of the son. There's actually no punishment. He forgives the son from the abundance of his love and there's no resentment and there's no bitterness. He accepts him for who he is, his beloved son. Number three, God's love, or number four, God's love is unconditional. There is nothing that was required in order for him to be forgiven. I suppose the fact that he came back so that he could forgive him, but he didn't even let him ask for forgiveness. The other thing, number four, Five is that it's absolute. God's forgiveness is absolute, meaning He doesn't hold on to anything. He doesn't keep a tally of the sins. He doesn't hold prior wrongs against us. He removes them how far? As far as the east is from the west. That is as far as far can be. He's completely started off brand new. Could you imagine if God held a record of the sins? I don't know how many times it's been, but he says, well, this sin adds one more, um, and every time you do this, our relationship would get worse and worse, and so with time, we're not going to get any closer. If he holds on to the number of mistakes that we've made. But there is a verse, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's a beautiful verse in the Psalms. His loving kindness he crowns us with every day. Then the last thing I want you to know about God's forgiveness is that it is done with eagerness. He forgives with a sense of eagerness. He wants to forgive. He's not holding back his forgiveness. He actually has as his goal reconciliation. That's the reason for his forgiveness. That's an important part of the forgiveness part. Rather than to change the relationship to one of servant and master or one who owes a debt, he restores and He elevates. God loves to forgive. Those are some examples of God-like forgiveness. Now I believe that all of us as Christians would say God's forgiveness is one of His greatest characteristics. It's what we truly depend on. How often do you seek it? Every day? Once? It's probably not enough. How do you seek the forgiveness? Is it with remorse over every sin? Or you just kind of say it as part of your prayers? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do you mention everyone? Or you just kind of lump them all together? Like just forgive us our sins. Like they're all the same. Or like some don't even matter. So you don't even talk about those. And yet... We never stop asking for the forgiveness. We rarely stop offending God. Yet we ask over and over. And we want God to continue to forgive us. If you examine the way that you ask for forgiveness, it would not be accepted by most people. Our half-hearted, repetitive, God forgive us our sins, which ones? Just forgive us all of them. Just please. It usually would not be accepted by one of us. 
Let me ask you, how many times have you sinned against God? I did a little bit of math because I'm a numbers guy. I looked at the age of my kids and I said, oh, starts to skyrocket around age five. And I said, you guys look mostly young. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Let's say you're 35. So let's say an average of 100 sins a day. I've averaged in the days you were stuck in traffic, the times you were put on hold for long bouts of time, the day you woke up with a little chip on your shoulder. I've averaged those in. 100 sins a day. Maybe I'm even being merciful. 30 years, 100 sins a day, roughly 1,095,000 sins. It's a lot. 1,095,000. Now, I realize some of us hit that benchmark at a much earlier age. Some of us were on like the 60 year plan at the age of 18. So like you guys are beyond the 1 million, you're on like the 5 million. Now, which sins do you ask God to forgive? Yeah, all 5 million of them, God. Um, what if he decided to stop at a million? What if he said, I've forgiven you a million times already. How many more do I have to forgive? Well, what if he decides I'm going to forgive all of them except for one? You've done so many things, but at this one sin, that's it. 1,094,999 sins, and that's it. How terrified would you be if you were to stop at even one? How many times do you say, God, punish me for my sin? I deserve it. A million times. I deserve five million punishments. Please. So, you know, forgive us. Have mercy on us. Blot out all our iniquities. Wash us thoroughly from our sins. Cleanse us, as we say in Psalm 50, right? With feeling or not, that's what we say. I know I've done a lot of sins. Please just forgive them. What we're looking for is recurrent, non-stop forgiveness without punishment, with the ability to always have a relationship with God that never gets damaged, it never gets diminished, it always remains in full force, it continues to get stronger, though we continue to sin, even after millions of sins, you want to be able to talk to God, and you still want to ask God favors all the time. Your own need for forgiveness. Seek reconciliation over separation. And then this other one. Cover the sins of others. Don't expose them. These two verses I just put here at the end I think are, are great. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, if you want to claim spiritual as your status, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted, knowing that you could sin as well. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Think about the days when you were most sinful. What was your burden? There might have been something going on that just made you just a wreck. Maybe had someone lifted your burden, you may have not gone so far. And in James, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is one of the most difficult. Now, in small groups, we'll talk more about forgiveness because I couldn't do it all here, but forgiveness needs to be on our radar. It needs to be our goal. What we want to desire, I want to be a forgiver. I want to be a forgiver. I don't want to hold anything against anyone. It's freedom for me, freedom for me. It's freedom for someone else. And I, as I was doing this talk, I began to think, like, what if I held, you know, what if God held things against people? Would we have St. Moses the Strong if he said, well, you've committed murder, you raped, you're a leader of a gang, you've stole, you've beaten, you've killed, you know. Ultimately, he was allowed to move beyond that. St. Mary of Egypt was able to move beyond that. When you forgive the offended person, was allowed to move beyond that. You never know what they might become. 
You never know what you might become if you continue to forgive. Pray about this. I know a lot of us probably have someone in our lives at one time that we've been upset with. This requires God's grace and God's gift of the Spirit and humility. But we want to be forgivers. May God be glorified in our lives now and forever. Amen.